Good morning. Happy Independence Day. I join Dr. Alan Wolf in thanking God for the freedoms he has given us. Freedom to worship God. Freedom to speak the truth without danger of being put in prison or shot. Freedom to go as missionaries anytime, anywhere. These precious freedoms came from God and they were also bought through the blood of our forefathers. They were not free. We should remember God's grace and the precious privilege we have of enjoying these freedoms and use them for the glory of God. Amen. Today, my message title is Live Before Your Father God. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Blood shed for our sins, which cleanses us and purifies us and has made us your children a royal priesthood. Father, please help us to live before you as your children. Instruct us, help us, teach us. Please bless this message and please speak through your words that we may receive your words in our hearts. Enable me to deliver it through your spirit. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. Our key verse is verse 4b. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. May we read this together one time, please? Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. In chapter 5, Jesus mainly taught the basic attitude and inner life of a Christian who is a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. But Christian life is not lived just internally. It is expressed in action. Through acts of righteousness, we love God and love our neighbors in very practical ways. In chapter 6, Jesus tells us about three kinds of acts of righteousness. Giving to the needy, prayer, and fasting. Giving to the needy relates to others and regards our estate, our bank account. Prayer relates to God and regards our soul. And fasting relates to ourselves and regards our body. When we practice giving, prayer, and fasting with integrity of faith and deeds, we can grow spiritually and be healthy, happy, fruitful children of God. Christian life is meaningful, rewarding, and joyful. The book, Hind's Feet on High Places, illustrates this well. It is an allegory about Christian life, similar to Pilgrim's Progress, based on Habakkuk 3.19. Do you know what a hind was? A deer, right? In Old English, it was a deer. A deer is able to jump from place to place on high mountain ledges without falling because his front feet and back feet land on the same spot. We can think of front feet as our faith and back feet as our actions. When our faith and actions are in harmony, we can travel the spiritual high places in our Christian life. This is what Jesus really wants for us. However, many people feel that their Christian lives have become dreary and fruitless. 
without true joy or peace, they feel driven all the time and become stressed out like a squirrel on a wheel. He's going to all the meetings, he's doing everything, but he's not getting anywhere. So, why does this happen? What can we do to correct it? In today's passage, Jesus gives us a warning not to be hypocrites in doing acts of righteousness. A hypocrite is an actor. What he says and does before others is not a true reflection of who he really is. Hypocrites do not live by the truth. They exchange the truth for fleeting glory of recognition by others, and in doing so are cut off from God. This is what makes life dry and boring and causes Christian activities to feel burdensome. Today, Jesus teaches us to guard against hypocrisy and to live before our Father God. In verse 1, Jesus said, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others, to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. Here, Jesus assumes that his disciples will carry out acts of righteousness. We Christians desire to do what is right in an unrighteous world. Metaphorically, we want to shine the light of Jesus into the dark world. This is expressed through acts of righteousness. However, not all acts of righteousness are accepted by God. There are some he does not accept. For example, both Cain and Abel brought offerings to God. Abel's offering was accepted by God, but Cain's was not. What God accepts is faith, not hypocritical acts done for human recognition. We all have a desire to be recognized by others. Therefore, we are all vulnerable to the sweet poison of human praise. What is the problem with it? There is no reward from God. Men praise us for five minutes. That's it. That's your reward. It does not give real meaning or lasting joy. So Apostle Peter confessed, all people are like grass and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, and the flowers fall. But the word of the Lord endures forever. God's reward is eternal. It truly satisfies our souls. We need God's reward. God's reward makes our lives joyful and meaningful and fruitful. Jesus does not want us to settle for empty human praise, but to be rewarded by God. So he teaches us how to practice acts of righteousness fruitfully. Let's learn in detail. First, giving to the needy. Look at verses 2 through 4. Giving to the needy is an important virtue of Christian life. But it is not practiced exclusively by Christians. It is also a virtue in Buddhism, Islam, Hinduism, and many other religions. But there is an important difference. Those of other religions give in order to gain salvation. Christians do not give to gain salvation. Christians give to express their thanks to God, who already saved us by his one-sided grace 
through faith in Jesus Christ. We received God's salvation free of charge. So we give to the needy free of charge. Jesus told his disciples, freely you have received, freely give. For Christians, giving is not something to boast about. It is a pure expression of the grace God has given us in Jesus Christ. What comes to your mind when you hear the words, giving to the needy? Is it a homeless person asking for a few dollars? We should, certainly should show compassion on such people, but this is just one small aspect of giving to the needy. Giving to the needy also includes giving spiritual help to needy souls, sharing the word of life with someone who is perishing, visiting and counseling a person with a problem, and encouraging the downcast are excellent forms of giving. How wonderful it is to spend time and money and to give our hearts in order to help the needy in this selfish world. Yet, when we give to the needy, it is easy for us to blow a trumpet. It is easy for us to announce before people, <clears throat> Now I am giving to the needy. Please pay attention and don't miss this. We may not verbalize it, but we say it in our hearts. We have trumpets in our hearts. Some people have an orchestra in their heart. Our generation excels in self-advertisement. Without advertising oneself well, it may be impossible to get a job. But Jesus warns us not to advertise our giving to the needy. If we do, there will be no reward from God. Jesus said they have received their reward in full. What then should we do? Look at verses 3 and 4a. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Hypocrites give alms with the right hand and blow the trumpet with the left hand. But Jesus said, our left hand should not know what the right hand is doing. He encourages us to keep our giving secret, even from ourselves. After giving, we should forget about it. In the parable of the sheep and goats, King Jesus foretold that he would reward his people for their good deeds. But they answer, when did we do these things? They had completely forgotten what they had done. However, God saw their good deeds, and God remembered them. Jesus said, Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. What is the reward? Proverbs teaches us that those who give freely gain even more and that God will cause the generous to prosper and refresh them. Psalm 112 verse 9 says that those who freely scatter their gifts to the poor will enjoy honor from God. Luke 14:14 14, 14 teaches us that those who give to the needy will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. This is God's everlasting reward which is greater than we can even imagine. When we give to the needy in secret, we gain this reward, both in this life and in the life to come. 
Second, prayer. Look at verses 5 through 8. What is prayer? Prayer is conversation with God. Prayer is personal fellowship with God. Sometimes in serving God, we don't know what to do. Sometimes we are exhausted. But through prayer, we can receive strength and wisdom and find direction in God. Without prayer, we cannot survive spiritually. Every great person of God whom God uses is a person who prays. Prayer can be a measure of piety. When a person kneels down and prays, that person looks holy. There's a picture of George Mueller praying with his head bowed and hands folded and with one loaf of bread before him. He looks so holy. He was used greatly by God through prayer. However, there is a great enemy in our prayer life, which is hypocrisy. Look at verse 5a. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. In truth, devoted Jews prayed three times a day, morning, noon, and evening. The prophet Daniel did this, and he would not be interrupted even at the risk of his life. When the time came to pray, pious Jews stopped whatever they were doing and prayed, even on the streets. They were like the prayer warriors among us, who pray at 5.30 a.m. every morning without fail. Those who prayed like this were recognized as pious people. Others, in an attempt to gain this recognition, prayed only in public with ostentatious displays. They would stand on a street corner on Devon and Western or in the marketplace at the Lincolnwood Mall and stretch out their arms and look up to heaven. Oh God, thank you I am not like other men. With their lips they prayed. In their hearts, they were saying, look at me, I'm praying, I'm holy. Jesus said, they are hypocrites. One great evangelist said, those who don't pray in private tend to pray long in public with many beautiful words. But those who truly pray in private keep their public prayers short. Some people use the time of prayer to boast about what they have done or to rebuke their prayer partner for something. This is not prayer. It is using the form of prayer for another purpose and it is hypocrisy. Then, with what attitude should we pray? Jesus teaches us two things in verses 6 and 7. First of all, we should pray privately. Look at verse 6a. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father. Who is unseen. To whom do we pray? To whom do we pray? Our Father, who is unseen. Prayer is not speaking to the air. It is a genuine conversation with our Father God, who is there. Our eyes do not see Him, 
but our faith informs us that he is present and he is listening. Where should we pray? In our room. This is a secret place where the door to the world is closed and the door for God is open. Jesus prayed in a solitary place. God wants us to have personal, intimate fellowship with him, undistracted by anything or anyone. So Jesus said, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father. Each person should have a secret place, a small room at the church, a corner in the backyard, or even a closet in their house. We should leave our computers, turn off our phones and iPads, and open our ears to God. He's right there, waiting to speak to us waiting to listen to us. We need this kind of prayer to live by faith victoriously in a troubled world. Some people say, I have no private place, so I cannot pray. Others say, I have no time to pray. When we try to come to God in prayer, we find there are many obstacles. When we begin to come to God personally in prayer, Satan works in many ways. So when we pray, we need to focus on God alone and pray to God, having a personal conversation with him. Karl Heim, a famous German theologian and a mentor of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, taught that we should pray as though our soul faces God alone while our bodies are buried underground. To that degree, leave the world behind and meet God in spirit. This may have been Father Abraham's attitude when he said, now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, though I am nothing but dust and ashes. Our prayer should be a spiritual, intimate meeting with God and God alone. Secondly, we should not repeat empty words, but pray according to our needs with faith. Look at verse 7. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Babbling is foolish or meaningless chatter. Pagans think if they keep babbling long enough, God will listen to them. So they repeat the same meaningless words again and again ad nauseum. There is a danger that ritual prayer can be the same. Such prayer is not connected to one's own soul as a reflection of true need. It is not connected to God in living faith. In verse 8, Jesus implies that our prayer should be based on our need. God wants us to ask for what we really need. Do you know what you really need? Hannah cried out for a son, and God gave her Samuel. A leper asked for healing, and Jesus made him clean. Two blind men asked for sight, and Jesus enabled them to see. God does not want us to be superstitious and ritualistic. He wants us to come to him with our genuine need as children coming to their father. God values the depth of our prayer rather than its length. God wants a genuine, 
personal relationship with us, not empty words. When we really cry out in faith, God hears us. Third, fasting. Let's look at verses 16 through 18. What is fasting? Fasting is to abstain from eating food with a spiritual purpose. In the Old Testament, the Israelites fasted once a year during the Day of Atonement. They also fasted when there was a national disaster or on other special occasions. For example, when the Jews faced the danger of being exterminated, Queen Esther said to Mordecai, Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. God blessed this fasting prayer and intervened and saved her and her people. However, during Isaiah's time, many people fasted without knowing the true meaning. So on the day of fasted, they exploited their workers and their fasting ended in quarreling and strife and striking each other with wicked fists. Fasting ended in boxing matches. Maybe when they fasted, they became very hungry. Then they became angry. And then they began to fight with each other. So Isaiah taught them that real fasting is to humble oneself before God, to do justice, and to help the needy. In the days of Jesus, pious Jews fasted twice a week, every Monday and Thursday. So fasting became the symbol of a pious life. While fasting, they did not wash their hair or trim their beards. They spread ashes on their faces and disfigured them. Oh, what's the matter with you? I'm fasting. <laughs> and then other people would say, oh, ah, you're a holy person. Jesus said, this was their full reward. These days, some boast of their fasting. I fasted for seven days. Another, I fasted 40 days like Jesus. I heard that one person wanted to fast more than 40 days and died on the 41st day. What does Jesus want us to do in regard to fasting? Look at verses 17 and 18. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Jesus wants us to fast before God our Father, not before men. Then our Father will reward us. In principle, fasting is not just abstaining from eating. It is to discipline our body for spiritual life. Worldly people live according to their flesh, but those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So we need to control not only our appetite for food, but our sleeping, our thoughts, our use of time, our words, and especially our sinful desires, such as lust, anger, hatred, pride, rebellion, laziness, and so on. We need to discipline ourselves to resist everything that hinders us from living with God. It is self-denial, and Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself. This too 
should be done before God, not before men. Today we have learned how to carry out acts of righteousness. When we survey this entire passage, we find that Jesus repeated three times the phrase, and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Let's read this verse, verse 4b, together one time. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Let's remember this verse and let's take two things away especially from this passage. First, we should do acts of righteousness before God. God sees everything. He sees all that is done in secret. Nothing is hidden from him. People look at the outward appearance, but God sees the heart. God sees not only our hidden deeds, but also our thoughts, our motives, even our unconscious world. We can deceive men, but we cannot deceive God. God cannot be mocked. We can avoid men's eyes, but not God's eyes. Before God's eyes, everything is laid bare. So King David said in Psalm 139, verse 1 through 4, You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. When we truly know God, we can do everything before his eyes. Second, we must seek God's reward. God is the God who rewards. God said to Abraham, I am your very great reward. Hebrews 11.6 says, And without faith, it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe, must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Many people say, ha! I don't need a reward. It's okay. I'm fine. I'll just do it because I'm a good person. But secretly, they seek a reward. After doing something, they're looking around, where's my reward? Where's my reward? Jesus did not tell us not to seek a reward. He told us there is a reward. There's a reward from men, and there's a reward from God. When we seek man's recognition, we will be miserable. We'll become hypocrites whose lives are empty, meaningless, and boring, unfruitful. But when we seek God's reward in doing acts of righteousness, he gives us himself. He gives us true satisfaction of soul. He gives us peace and joy, meaning, and a fruitful life. And we can grow in the image of God. Let's not live before men only, but before our Father God, so that we may be healthy spiritually and truly happy and God may be pleased by our lives of faith. 
Let's read our key verse, verse 4, uh, 4b, one more time. Please. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your love for us and for your teaching to us that you do not want us to seek recognition from people in practicing acts of righteousness because it is fleeting and empty and we turn out to be hypocrites. But thank you for teaching us to seek you and your reward, to live before you and to do acts of righteousness for your eyes only. Father, please bless each one of us and please help us by your grace. Sanctify our hearts, purify our motives, strengthen our faith so we may truly see you and our eyes may be fixed on you and everything we, we do may be done for you to see and believing your reward. And please use us to reveal your glory and help us to grow in your image. And please make us a blessing to the people of our time. I ask in Jesus' name, amen.